What is up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of After Impact. I am your host, Tom Bilyeu, and I am here with Agent Smith. Who's Mr. Just putting, Bill Yu. putting in our, our little uh, our totems, as it were. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome, Welcome to you. Welcome to our audience. Welcome to Uri, buddy. Yes. This is a special episode of After Impact. Yes. Because we've had a special episode of Impact Theory this week, and that is our, we call it our hack show, but it's really about um, the top 10 brain hacks that you can use from our guests, the world's highest achievers, things you can do in your life to level up and unleash your success, as Indeed. the title says. Indeed. There it so, is. So we're going to dive into it, and just a reminder, everyone, this is After Impact, the show where Tom and I go deep into the episode of Impact Theory, answer your questions. Uh, I have questions. Um, we discuss what was the episode about, how can it be applied, and, uh, and kind of go off on tangents from there. But they're, <laughs> but they're, but they're productive tangents. So. That is the hope, yes. Yeah. So um, if you've seen this episode, or uh, if you've seen some of the episodes, this is really a compilation. And what we did was we went through the last 30, I think we've done 32 now, 30 episodes, and said, um, what are the most really actionable pieces of, pieces of advice from our guests that we could give back to our audience as a way to just remind them of uh, some of these techniques that they can use. And uh, we tried to pull the best ones out, um, ones that will really help you tap into a growth mindset, really help you um, put together an execution plan so that you can go out and pursue your dreams and your vision of success. And I think these ones are fantastic. Nice. And I was, I, you know, I reviewed the episode this morning and I was like, so, so much of this I already forgot, mm, which scares uh, me. I know. That's scary. There's just so much content, so much good content. And so it's like, how do you um, put it into action before it slips away? Mm. Which brings me to one of my first questions. Yeah. So the nerd writer who we all know is one of my favorite, yes. favorite episodes. Um, he says that, he says it's important to trans. I just love his wording too. It's important to transfer cloudy knowledge into explicit knowledge. Mm. And the way that he did it was through writing it down. And he wrote this discourse on truth, which is this very, he called it a very highfalutin thing right. that he gave to his family and friends. Um, totally sounds like something I would have done in college. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, very on brand. I have to say, is, Evan Pushak, the nerd writer, is is a very on brand choice for you for yeah. like one of your favorite episodes. No he, question. He is indeed. He's amazing though. I'm with you on that one. Yeah. And I just love his idea because for me, I feel like until you write it down, you don't really mm. engage with that information. Yeah. So I want to talk to you about that writing things down. I know you're taking a lot more notes on the books you read. Um, how do you transfer knowledge from sort of cloudy? Like you kind of understand it into something explicit that you can actually use in your life. So I do a little bit of writing, but that, um, that isn't as effective for me as the series of content that we put out. This really is my way, like a lot of times. So when we do meetings, I was just saying this to you guys yesterday. Um, one of the things that I think I'm very rightly accused of as a leader in business is under communication. Mm. But you can't imagine what a surprise that was for me. Yeah, I feel like I am talking all the time and in that like because i like it understand i have a high degree of suspicion of anything that i actually enjoy doing <laughs> this is this is going to be confusing for people so because very often your goals demand of you things that aren't necessarily intrinsically fun and for so many years my compass was exactly what are the things that I dislike doing because that's almost certainly what I should be doing. What's the first rule of nutrition? If it tastes good, spit it out. It was like my whole life was around don't do the things you really want to do. Do the things that your goals demand. Now, in that, hopefully people understand that around the eight and a half year mark, I totally broke with all of that in my uh, path as a entrepreneur, I broke with that and I began to ask a fundamentally different question, which is, what would I love doing every day even if I were failing? But old habits die hard. And because there still is so much truth to the fact that a lot of times your goal will demand something that is in the micro very painful, but in the grand scheme of things is something that absolutely has to be done. And hopefully on balance, you believe in what you're doing enough that it, you know, in total is still a lot of fun, but there is forever going to be that friction between those two things. So 
because I get so much out of articulating things out loud, they say, if you want to really understand something, teach. It's in that articulation process, one, you're communicating back to yourself, and I've quoted this quote many times, and I really do need to look up who said it. I speak not so I can be understood, but rather so I can understand, right? Mm -hmm. So when I'm verbalizing, I am going through a process of really grasping at myself. And in, in doing that, it, I am always surprised how much it's becoming explicit for me in the verbalization process. So yesterday when I was talking to the group, I was saying, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse. I, I have thought about this so much right. and feel like I've articulated it out loud. And I'm having so much fun articulating it because it becomes more real and more concrete in me. And I'm like, whoa, I'm taking this cloud and I'm making it explicit knowledge that it feels indulgent. So I, I try to check myself. So imagine for a second, you go to see a world-class nutritionist and they're shredded, just great shape. They're 150 years old. So like you believe every word out of their mouth. You're like, yeah. oh my God, this is real and amazing and backed up. And they say, Jared, the secret, like you just need to eat more of your favorite foods in way higher quantities, drink a lot more beer. Um, like that's the secret to, to longevity and performance. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be like, wait a second. Yeah. That's how I feel when people are like, no, you haven't communicated the vision enough. Because I'm like, but that's what I want to do. Like, I want right. to sit around and tell you guys what I'm thinking. I want to sit around and leverage you as a sounding board to walk you through, like, this is how it's evolving. This is how it's changing in right. my mind. Because in doing that, it becomes so much more concrete for me. So when I get on a rant here um, and I can feel like everybody is really locked in, like they're excited, they're maybe understanding something for the first time, like that, that is the most fun for me. And this is all invisible for the community because we don't record any of this stuff. It's literally just us here at Impact House, like really having a fucking moment, right? So right. the other day I went and met with one of the, one of the highest level physicists on the planet. Yeah. And I had so much fun in that. that. I wrote a whole fucking vague newsletter about it. <laughs> one day it will cease to be vague. But so I, one thing I wanted to explain to the team why, A, why I had been vague, and then B, um, why it was so important to what we're doing and how it's really going to help us differentiate and, and really do something new. And I was like, this moment right here with the team is literally one of the highlights certainly of the summer for me, maybe of the year, like it was just, it was, I had learned something from this physicist, which was very grand and has massive imp implications, just like in, in our understanding of, of the physical world. Uh, and it was giving me a chance to articulate it so that it would become more concrete. So I'll stop there, but it's like, I'm saying all of that because that's my way mm -hmm. of doing it. Evans is very much to write it down. I don't, while useful, I don't get as much joy out of that. Um, I think we have a mic issue. Your arm is in the way. I, I'm not sure what that means. Is it just, are we talking about visuals or are we talking about? Okay. So the mic is a little bit in the, in the way of your I'm going to call bullshit. Shot. But anyway. I can see that camera. <laughs> <laughs> it's maybe blocking my chest. Not the arm in the back. The it, uh, of the screen, the, TV. the screen. Okay. Wow, we just lost a lot of our life to that. <laughs> All right, so we'll we'll have to. Yeah. At the end of the day, here's the solution: the mics have to be moved to the outside. But that should be done before we start rolling. We're processing live, everyone. We Welcome are. to our world. The funny thing is, I thought, do I say this out loud? And I thought, yeah, let the community see. Like this yeah. is this is how. So, so you run a business. It is yep. mundane shit. Yep. It's a little <laughs> stuff sometimes. Got to do it. Yeah. So um, it's interesting you talked about trying to avoid the things that bring you happiness yeah. and, it, and when they come into conflict with your goals. Um, and there's a couple of the hacks in the show from our guests, I think, have a theme of happiness. There's one, Jessica Matthews, she says, um, she asks herself, um, am I happy? And that's kind of a macro gut check of where she is in life and what she should be pursuing and maybe she should change what she's pursuing. And then you have Vanessa Van Edwards who talks about um, happy math, which is micro moments, looking at your day really in this 
few things that you do, whether it's drinking a hot cu um, cup of coffee or um, you know talking to a friend for five minutes and, and catching up, she says you have to add up these moments of happy math and then see where you're spending your time. So I want to ask you, how do you square sort of happiness with your goals? Is, you talked about something that, as you, that you avoid, but what happens when happiness, like in this instance, you are articulating the vision, which is happy for you and is also actually very effective for the company. And we're just starting to realize that. So that's one of those moments where it's something that I thought was out of alignment with my goals, but I realize, oh my God, some, it's going to that nutritionist and he's telling me, and I see that it's real, that the answer is eat more junk food, um, drink more of the, like put, put more heavy cream in your coffee, you yeah. know, it's like, wait, what? <laughs> uh, all the things that I secretly want to do, but only don't because I think it's out of alignment with my goals. Mm -hmm. So when somebody, you realize like, oh my God, this actually is an alignment. Like recently I've realized that consuming more pop culture content is now, it definitely was not. So this was not a moment where I realized, oh my God, I've just been off this whole time. Yeah. The, the like planets finally aligned and now it really does make sense and it's something that will move us forward. So that was awesome and that felt right and I could tell internally, externally, I really looked at it and I was like, okay, the, the moment has finally come. So that was really pleasurable for me and I'm very excited about that. Um, and that led into this weekend. So Cindy had primed me by saying that she was doing a sleepover, which I hope that's not like a, a not talk about thing. Spoiler alert. Uh, I think it's okay. Uh, so she was certainly very open about it, but her and her friends were doing a sleepover in their 20s. Thought that was so cool. And that Saturday, I look over at my wife and I realize every weekend I have a sleepover with my best friend. And it was super cheesy, as cheesy as it sounds right now. Yeah. But it was such a neat realization. So it was like I was pursuing my goals, but we were watching TV as a part of that. And I'm there with like my best friend. And like I'm like, I fucking love my life. So it was that was really neat. And so then this moment where the team is saying, hey, like almost sheepishly, it would be really great if you shared the vision more often. Which doing that, I get so caught up in the emotion of what we're doing that we're really going to help people, that this is actually going to make a big difference in a lot of people's lives, that we're going to do it in a methodology that actually is super enjoyable. It's the creative process for me is my first love. It's where I started. It's that thing I've been drawn to since I was 12. So there's this sense of like real um, homecoming, returning to uh, the base of my strength, like and, and this was the, so I think in movies, I think in comics, like that's just always been a thing for me. And I remember when I had that real friction in my journey as an entrepreneur and was like, I can't hate every day. I can't. And why can't I? Because the reason that the, the mythology of Superman is so important to me is because Superman is a normal human unless... He's in the yellow sun. And when you take this stuff for metaphor and you don't take it literally, and I started saying, okay, what is it in my life that's my yellow sun? What makes me capable of something more than anybody else? And that's passion. It's tapping into that thing that makes me feel alive. Mm -hmm. And when I'm articulating the vision, I really do feel invincible. I feel that I feel feel that sense and I want people to hear the difference between when you understand it intellectually and when you feel it and like your mitochondria are producing energy more efficiently. That's literally what it feels like. When you're in complete alignment with all the things that just make you feel you, powerful, alive, all that, and it is the thing that aligns with your code of what I should be doing, or I should be living um, in a way that facilitates my goals. I just believe that to the core of my being. So like when those two things come together, it's, it's really, really extraordinary. So finding the happy math as Vanessa Van Edwards talked about, I think is, is really important. Figuring out what those things are that actually triggered that in you is really important. Like actually doing the math, right? As she yeah, talks about, yeah. I think that's really important. And what I loved is in her breakdown of that, she talks about like, sometimes it's just that amazing cup of coffee. Yeah. So, uh, by way of example, every morning I put a monster in the freezer, a zero calorie monster in the freezer for 20 minutes. And it starts to get like a little bit slushy. It's just <laughs> starting to turn yeah, to I ice. And I drink half of it. 
And that half a fucking monster brings me a ridiculous amount of joy. Yeah. Just does. Like that's, that's some happy math for me right there. That's awesome. So it's, you know, stuff big and small. It's little things. And how about the big things? Are you doing what um, Jessica Matthews says, which is, you know, every six months or so, just asking that big question, like, am I happy doing this? I'm not going to answer what you just asked, but only because it, it reminded me of something that I wanted to say when you first asked the initial question um, on to the big thing. So how is it smart when you're thinking happy math to so constantly be pushing off the things that you love and, and enjoy? And here's something that I really, really want people to hear. And this is one of those things, I'm gonna say it going back to over communicating, I'm gonna say it a thousand times and for whatever reason on a thousand and one, it's gonna hit somebody and they're gonna realize what I'm actually saying. The greatest, the greatest joy that I feel in my life about myself, the thing that brings me the most pride, so actual pleasure and joy, mm -hmm. is my willingness to suffer for what I want. Let that one sink in. So in those moments where I'm sort of emotionally gasping for breath, I think of me like somebody doing, um, you know, like they're training for the Olympics or whatever, and they're just pushing themselves to a point of like, you're watching and they're like vomiting in a trash can and you think, why are they doing this? And internally that person is awash in a sense of identity pride, self-respect, joy, even though from the outside, it doesn't look like it. That to me is framework happiness. Mm. So when I'm explaining the vision to the team, that's momentary happiness, okay? It's excitement, but it will dissipate very rapidly. But the fact that I'm able to articulate that and that it's a vision that other people gravitate towards is because I make so many crazy demands of myself, the amount of time. It's one of those things, a very secret part of me, and I won't because I think it's ultimately douchey, but a very secret part of me wants people, like, wants cameras so people know how fucking early I get up, how disciplined I am about the amount of work I do. Like the other day I woke up at 2 a.m. Just woke up, right? I, I think people think I set an alarm. I don't. I just fucking woke up at 2 a.m. But I'm so driven, I get out of bed, I start the process, I go right to it. I'm meditating, I'm thinkitating, I'm taking these notes, I'm reading contracts, like I'm just pushing everything, everything forward for like eight hours before the, the team gets here. And I'm like, this is why. Like when people go, I had no idea, like that's where the vision was. Because we, we all can't help it, right? The other people in our lives cease to exist until we open the door and we see them again. But what you don't see is like, Endlessly working and pushing myself. And even though from the outside it looks like the sprinting and vomiting in the trash can and all that, I am so proud of being willing to do that, that even though it's giving things up, even though it's, um, you know, at times it's exhausting, even though it's, there's so many things in my life that I don't have and have pushed off or just straight decided I'm not gonna do. But for me, it brings deep emotional well-being. Like in, in a way that's untouchable. No one can get under my skin or damage my sense of myself. And that's so important. No one can damage my sense of self, right? You say whatever you want in the comments. You can, uh, like if I know you and you mean something to me, you could attack me. I know who I am. I know I put in the work, not every day, there's days where I fail myself, but I'm proud of the fact that I'll be honest about that and say, and I often do this like on a, not an hourly basis, but every two or three hours, there's a voice that's like, either you've made the most of those two or three hours or you haven't. And I like that. I'm proud of that. I'm not proud that like I have some perfect record because I do not. I'm proud of the fact that I'm willing to keep a record. Mm. I love it. What would you tell someone who doesn't um, source their sense of well-being and deep personal pride and joy from that same thing? That they're playing a dangerous game because they probably get their sense of well-being and deep personal pride out of the fact that they optimize those last three hours. And that's so dangerous because there's going to be times where you don't optimize those three hours. So it's this weird friction between 
I'm not gonna take pride in that. It's gonna feel good when I do it, it just is. Yeah. It's like the days where you look good. You can't help but be like, all right, I'm looking good right now. <laughs> High five me. Right? Yeah. So like that's a real thing of the human condition. Yeah. So cool, enjoy it. But if you're building your sense of pride and self-esteem and all that around something that is so fragile, it's just really, really dangerous. So it's like the more knowledge I accumulate, the more tempting it is to be like, I actually am smart. And I know it's a trap, so I don't allow myself to reward myself for being smart. Instead, when a moment shows up and I'm able to like, like last night, we did that panel and I'm sitting, and the funny thing is people watching that panel, if you guys didn't watch it, we did a panel with the Modius Health team uh, and they were here and I'm there with some of the brightest minds in science, okay? To my left is V.S. Ramachandran, V.S. fucking Ramachandran. And I get it, most people don't know who that is, but that's one of those people, as you start to dig in and realize what he's done and the way in which he has been acknowledged by the scientific community, he is going to be remembered, okay? V.S. Ramachandran will be remembered. So he's one of those guys that right up until the singularity, like people are gonna know who he is, like yeah. that give a shit about that. And he's fucking to my left. And that I had enough confidence to articulate my own sort of understanding of the state of neurological science, right? If I'm wrong, he's just gonna lean into the mic and be like, who the fuck is this buffoon, right? So to get to a point where you've done that, it would be very foolish and dangerous for me to reward myself for actually being able to articulate it. So instead, what I do is I reward myself for, dude, well done for putting in the work, because this has been 20 years of reading books about neuroscience, knowing that I knew nothing, fumbling my way through the dark, always asking people questions when I didn't know, never being afraid to embarrass myself and look stupid. Like that's what I reward myself for, right? right. Like well done for not being afraid to look stupid so many times that you always asked and for just being the learner because that is anti-fragile. You could, you, Anti-fragile is the more you attack it, the more you try to break it, the stronger it gets. Not that it's resilient or tough. So once people can switch their sense of self-esteem to something that is truly anti-fragile and then not fall prey to the trap of, because I focused on being a learner for so long, I'm now actually good, okay? I'm now actually smart. But I, I still don't pride myself on that. So if I woke up tomorrow and realized, oh God, I'm actually way dumber than I thought, which by the way, the more you learn about something, the dumber you feel by the fucking day. It is so hilarious yeah. because you begin to realize like how big the world is and like how much more there is. So when you can meet that with humility because you're not having any sense of pride around that, you continue to supercharge. I can feel the more I explain this, like I'm losing more and more people as I go. But the, for the like six people now that are still with me, like they get it and they're fucking nodding fiendishly because they understand the, the acceleration, how it goes faster and faster and faster. The more humility you have, the more you're willing to accept your ignorance, the dumber you're willing to look. Like you're the one that's growing faster and faster and faster and actually getting better and better and better. Like. You could not have possibly, this is actually, you couldn't have convinced other people around me that, you know, 20 years in the future that I'd be sharing the stage with Dr. Drew Pinsky, um, Jason, Dr. Jason McEwen, and Dr. V.S. motherfucking Ramachandran, like, and that yeah. they would, when the cameras weren't rolling and strike me dead, anyone here, like, they were like, you know your shit. So, learn, learn, learn. That's awesome. Don't be afraid to look stupid. Pride yourself on that. Can I tell a quick V.S. Ramachandran story? Please, they're my favorite. I was cleaning out my bookshelf the other day, and I came across a book called A World of Ideas, which is, was actually a textbook I used when I was in my graduate program and teaching writing to the undergrads. And this is like intro to writing, so you know, basic rhetoric, argumentation, uh, how to convey an idea. And the point of this book was to expose people to different writing styles because they're all essays mm. and then to just different ideas. And it's, it's really like the best ideas in the world from across every subject matter, right? So it's literature, it's um, science, it's philosophy, like it's Machiavelli, it's all the big names. And I'm flipping through it 
And who do I come across? V.S. Ramachandran. Yeah. There's an essay from him in the book. And I was just like, I can't believe we had this guy on the show. So, Dude, cool. V.S. is, he is unbelievable. Yeah. Like he's unbelievable. And because he's like this unassuming guy, and he's not, look, guys at that level don't get famous like that. So you have to be like in that world. But he's rewatched the panel, right? Listen to what Dr. Drew says. I can't believe I'm sharing the dais with V.S. Ramachandran, right? Yeah. It, but it's like, from a fame perspective, thousand times more people know who Dr. Drew is right. than know who V.S. is. But V.S. carries fucking weight. Yeah. That's awesome. Really cool. Let's do a couple quick shout outs, uh, international shout outs. We got okay. people tuning in from all over the world. What's up, Lars von Epsi from New Zealand. That's oh, a cool name. Epsi. That is a cool name. We got Tommy Westing from Norway and Capital Dev from uh, India. Nice. What's up, guys? Thanks for joining. Uh, okay. So please submit your questions. We're on Facebook Live right now. Hopefully, you watch the Brain Hacks episode, which is really cool. It's the best, some of the best ideas from all of our guests distilled into a 30 minute episode. You can just go in, watch it a couple times. A lot of actionable takeaways in there that you can apply to your life immediately. Um, that's a question I have for you, Tom. Is are there any? So, what are your favorite hacks from the show? Are there any things that you applied in your life? Yeah. So, my favorite. Yes. There's a lot that I've applied in my life from this episode, and I'll give you one. What can you learn from the people you hate the most? Which is one of Tim Ferriss's ones. That's, that's something one. that I've used. Amazing. That guy's book, The Four Hour Work Week, changed me fundamentally, um, and it's really supercharged me as an entrepreneur. Uh, but my favorite one is from Naveen Jain and how to learn something mm. new when you're going to go into an area. Um, how do you begin that process of becoming an expert? And I love his notion of move into areas where you're not the expert because you now don't take, there's nothing that you just take for granted. So you question everything and it is fascinating how effective that is mm -hmm. and i don't think it's an accident that what we did at quest we did precisely because we were outsiders and we didn't know anything about being a food manufacturer and so we challenged every assumption and just came up with a whole new way of doing things um, and it ended up you know being utterly transformative so uh, i think that that really is just super super smart and it's something i think a lot about like because now my my current vision, and I know better than to plant a flag and say never, but my current vision for Impact Theory is this is brick by brick being built to be my forever company. I never plan to sell it. I never plan to move on to anything. Now again, like never say never, sure. but I'm, I'm really trying to make it a platform company and it's, um, it's why it's the first time while I obviously still have a partner my current partner is literally the other half of my existence. So it's why I didn't want to bring in outside partners. Like it needed to be one clear vision. Lisa and I went into this and I said the same thing that I said to you guys, which was let me be abundantly fucking clear. What this is, this is my vision that we're going to be executing on. Here it is. If that excites you and you want to be a part of that, I need you and can't do this without you, but I'm not going to battle for the vision. So if people are on board, then awesome, let's do it. So I really believe that this could end up being my forever company. Um, and I think so much about this notion of not letting your knowledge calcify into dogma because then you grow stagnant, you're not challenging things, you're not um, disrupting yourself and most people aren't capable of disrupting themselves. And there's been all these studies done on like when people that win the Nobel Prize, how old they were when they did the work and it's like some overwhelming, like 80% of all Nobel Prizes are given to people who did their work in their 20s and 30s. And so it's like, do they get less smart? Like what happens? Right. And especially because we're going into an artistic field, like when was the last time a 55 year old musician dropped an album that topped the charts um essentially never right so david bowie did he top the charts with a new album well his last album i think did really well and he was probably over 55 i'm he not sure i think he died i think he was in his 60s, 60s. yeah so I, I get your point though, what's fa yeah. no 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 but it's good that you bring that up so what's fascinating is a i didn't know that which tells you to what extent he actually sort of 
took over the world. And then second, that there's one. Can you name another? Because no. most of the time no. they top the charts, it's like on the, whatever they call the contemporary chart, right? Which yeah. is essentially for people over 40. Uh, it just, it's so rare. And it really begs the question, why? Is it because youth culture is just so dominant a buying force and they only respond visually to people that look like them? I don't know, but it really, really happens rarely. So setting that aside, maybe that's controversial. What's not controversial is the Nobel Prize thing. So, and then from that was spawned the quote, genius is a young man's game. And so it's like, all those things scare me beyond measure because I believe your future should never be smaller than your past. So you've got to have a way where you're going to be doing bigger things and like for real actually doing them. So one of the ways that you can do that is what Naveen says, which is constantly be shifting into these new arenas where you're not uh, an established expert and then learning as rapidly as you can, as much as humanly possible. And so that when going back through the episode, and I remember when he said it on set, I was like, that sits at the core of my identity. Like always wanting to learn more, always wanting to step outside my comfort zone, always wanting to to really understand something. So at first for me, it was neuroscience and, and I will continue my obsession with that. And now it's really getting into um, the microbiome and functional medicine. And because between my mom and my wife who have struggled very profoundly with what I believe are functional health issues, I've had to just own that and say, these people are suffering in my life and it's entirely my fault. We all know. Extreme ownership. Extreme ownership. Uh, and so I'm going to become an expert. I'm going to know more than doctors. And um, yeah, I'm, I, I will. Yeah, I loved, I loved his concept. I thought it was brilliant. And even on a tactical level, it was brilliant. So he said, first, the first thing you do is you have to understand the terminology in that arena. So learn the definitions um, so you can just orient yourself. And then he said he um, uses Twitter or probably a, like a tweet deck tool or something mm -hmm. to um, find all of the uh, journals in that field and search specifically on the keywords that he's looking to learn more about. And then he just wakes up every morning and reads those articles. So the newest information coming out on those very specific subjects. Yeah. Like, That's brilliant. It is. You and can apply that to anything. Simple. Yeah. 100%. Awesome. Um, here's a question from Rhett Coots. His uh, question is, top three things that contribute to your ability to hyper-focus and learn new things rapidly. Kind of touched on that a little bit, but. Yeah, so I want to give real answers. I want this to become the hallmark of my content. So we were talking um, a little bit about this yesterday because I owe you, we talked about Vanessa Van Edwards after Impact, knowing that your language of appreciation is acts of service. Mm -hmm. I wanted to take something off your plate, which is to come up with a list of mantras as I was that I use on a daily basis. As I started doing that, I realized I don't actually do that. Yeah. And so to give you what you asked for would be to violate my code, which would be to create sort of just fluff bullshit yeah. and put it out. So I was like, okay, what's the real answer? Like, what do I actually do? And in doing that, it started to be like actually quite intriguing to me, the process that I actually go through. So I want to give him that same kind of a real answer here. So um, what are the top three ways that I hyper focus on something? Yeah. So first, I think it's important to know if I had to guess, I have some mild form of attention deficit disorder. So I find myself having to... I practice this in meditation. So one, it's always going to be something to do with practice, like getting good. Like if you want to hyper-focus on something, you have to actually practice hyper-focusing. So in meditating, I find my mind wanders very rapidly, very rapidly. And I think that's actually what makes me good at creative, good at writing. I have so many ideas that are coming to me, coming to me, coming to me. Like when I read... Um, Stephen King's The Dark Tower, and true spoiler alert, by the way, so if you are in the middle of reading the series and you haven't finished, you should stop watching right now. Um, but he he puts himself in the book, which has caused like this complete uproar. And But I found it fascinating because in the book, he's talking about how these ideas, like he doesn't even know where the hell they're coming from. Like he just has these ideas, 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 and writing them down is like the way for him to sort of manage it. Yeah. And I feel the same, like ideas, ideas, ideas. And in one way, it's awesome. And I know that impact theory is going to be known as the house of ideas. And like we're, once we start executing on the creative, like dude, 
my list of just, just the comics I think we should be doing is already fucking spastically long. So, and it's just gonna get longer and longer and longer, which is why we need to get a group of writers and creatives in here because I wanna give them the ideas and then, then they go execute because I don't have time to execute on them all. Right. So training myself to not chase every idea as it comes through because from a be an entrepreneur, build a business, it isn't useful. So what helps me as a creative is hurting me as an entrepreneur. Sure. <clears throat> so I've had to learn how to get control on that. One of the ways was simply learning to focus on my breath. To notice that, oh shit, I'm not thinking about my breath, come back to the breath. Oh shit, I'm not thinking about my breath, come back to the breath. And being able to lengthen the periods of time where you can keep yourself focused and the, the tricks that you begin to use. So here's a trick, you're meditating. Oh, you're supposed to focus on your breath. How do you do that? Because a lot of times you don't even notice that your mind is wandering. So one of the things that I came up with was to make each part of the four part breath cycle to maximize its pleasure. So now that gave me a hook into the breath, right? So let's say I'm working on a contract and I'm going through and I, my mind keeps wandering, my mind keeps wandering. So how do I keep it? One of the things that I've done, and this is, um, I, don't, I don't have the words for this yet because I've never had to articulate it to anybody, but as I'm going through um, a contract and I hit a part that's actually quite confusing, like you'll get in a contract, you'll have a section that long that's a single fucking sentence. Yeah. Which makes me want to universally assault lawyers because it does not need to be that way. But nonetheless, it is that way. And so you find yourself like having to like fucking hold these concepts and they keep parenthetical, parenthetical, parenthetical. And it's like, ah, like I'm trying to. So what I do, literally what you see me doing now, I put myself in a position, I'll sit up more straight, I will tell my brain, speed up. And then I will leverage a little bit of anger to keep me fucking focused. I'll furl my brow. It's just all these like little hacks that I know I need to do to laser focus. And because I know, like I'm a tips and tricks guy, right? Yeah. Or a hacks guy, to use the yes. word. Like I understand there are biological things that I can do, physical things that I can do to maximize the secretion of certain chemicals in my brain to get me to whatever state that it is that I'm trying to get to. And so I'll do that type of focus. That's specifically what I do in contracts. Um, but that minus probably the anger is one of the ways that I use to focus on a lot of other things. Um, and then also just really making sure, like if somebody is, um, it's interesting, I've never realized that I, I do this quite universally. If you said, I'm about to tell you something and I really need you to pay attention, or my wife said, this is important. I would literally fully orient myself to that person because that does something yeah. to direct your attention. I've seen I'm, you do this actually. That's really fucking interesting. Yeah. Uh, Cause I would have thought it was all invisible. <laughs> I'm gonna like furrow my brow. I'm literally gonna put my head forward and I'm going to fucking burrow into their soul with my yeah. eyes so that I can literally feel everything at my periphery deadening and yeah. sort of going black. And then in my mind, I'm really following like every concept that they're saying to make sure that it strings together. And the fucking second I don't understand something, you'll see me do it sometimes in interviews. The second I don't understand either what they're saying or their motive behind saying it, I'll ask. Yeah. And be, I think one of the reasons people stop paying attention is because they get a little bit confused and they don't want to ask, oh, I don't want to interrupt or whatever. Right. And so now they don't understand and that lack of understanding tends to exacerbate as it goes. And so now they're just sort of hopelessly lost and they just let it go. Yeah. Um, no, it's great. I've seen you do that for sure. And, uh, it's very effective. I think too, like you said, signaling to the other person, like you have my full attention, um, which, which is good. Do you listen to music when, when you're, let's say needing to be hyper-focused on a contract or working on something that requires, a you know, it's attention? interesting if I were by myself, no. And the reason is, the only reason I listen to music, I listen to music for two reasons. If I'm low energy and I need a pump up, which mm -hmm. music for me is very effective for that. And then two, to drown everyone out so I can't hear other conversations. Because man, if people are talking around me, I find myself trying to follow their conversation and follow what's happening in the contract and I'm sure. absolutely terrible at it. So for that, I will use music. I use different types of music depending on what I'm doing. If I'm replying to comments, which is usually sort of low cognitive load, I'll put on fun music with lyrics, like just pop music, right? And yeah. really like, I'm there, I'm in a great mood, I'm answering the questions, a lot of fun. And that's sort of my reward, uh, because I, I really, really enjoy reading our, the comments that come in. 
Um, and then if I'm doing something that is like a contract or something like that, I'll put on music that doesn't have lyrics because the lyrics themselves draw my attention. Yes. Now, the reason that if I'm alone, I don't listen to music is because even the, the musical movements will to some degree grab my attention. Mm. So I would much prefer just like, Total Silence, which yeah. is one of the reasons I love getting work done at like three in the morning. It's dark, which does something to me subconsciously. I sit in a dark room mm -hmm. and even my like the only light will be either my computer or my phone. And I'll turn the screen down so that it's like as dim as possible. So it's like my senses are just sort of collapsing in on themselves and I can really, really go hard. You're like the creative person that stays up really, really late to do their creative work, except you just reversed it and you get up really, really early. Yeah, yeah. that's 100% true. And the funny thing is I used to do my creative work at night. Yep. And I remember I my that. poor wife, in fact, even funnier. So we had this dog named Batman who sadly passed away. Um, and Batman, of course. And he would around probably 7 p.m., he would start getting energetic by 10 p.m. he was amped because he was so used to me stopping work at like 11 at night. Yeah. So his schedule was just weird. And so, cause I would stop work say 11 or midnight and then would play with him until like two in the morning and then go to bed and repeat the cycle. So his entire life, he was way more nocturnal. That's funny. Um, speaking of Tim Ferriss's questions, one that I would love to ask you here is, Gun to your head, if you can only work for two hours a week, what would you work on? So I'll answer that in a second, but what's more usable for everybody, the one, I think it was you that asked me the other day, like, how are we going to differentiate? We were coming back from a meeting um, with a, a high-level comics guy, and you were saying, like, basically, how are we going to accelerate? Like, what's going to keep us from getting caught? Because if you look at people in the comics world, Man, it, it is a very long slog for them to create IP that actually yeah. makes its way to TV and film. And you were rightly asking, like, how do we avoid that fate? And I thought, wow, that's, that is never going to happen to us. And the reason that is never going to happen to us is I'm asking that question 150 times a day. Yeah. Gun to my head, you have to do this, right? Um, Peter Thiel talks about this in his book, like everybody has a 10-year plan, but what stops you from asking, how do I take my 10-year plan and execute it on the next six months? Now, I really believe the greatest contribution I will ever make to you as a human being, you and I will work together long enough you're gonna start doing this. And it will just stop being weird for you because it, you've already come a long way. But at first you used to think that I was fucking just setting a ridiculous goal just to like, yeah, like, here we go. This is a stupid goal. We're never going to be able to achieve that. And, but it has this way of galvanizing people to, we're going to have to like think totally differently. And You're that right. was the point to Tim is the gun to my head. I can only work two hours a week. It forces you to like scrap every assumption that you have. And look, it doesn't matter if you actually create, make your 10 year plan come true in six months, you will be so much farther along just because you're asking the questions. It's yep. going to force you to think crazy outside the box. It's like, this is why I'm always trying to meet people that we can potentially partner with. It's why, like, I remember one time, this was probably 13 years ago. Already back then, I was like, one day I'm going to write a book and I'm going to be, you know, writing movies and directing them. And my thing was, I will write my own book. And um, my friend was like, well, dude, why don't you use a ghostwriter? And he was like, you've got these ideas. It's the idea that's important. Like, and then they go off and actually make sentences. But at the end of the day, they're just articulating your ideas. And I was like, you're out of your mind. No way. Like the joy is like being the one writing all the sure. words. And then the same as a filmmaker, I said, I will never direct something that I don't write. So I want to write it myself and then direct it myself. And then probably three or four years ago, Lisa was like, you know, do you think that you'll, do you still want to direct? And I was like, no, it's not scalable. And at some point in my journey as an entrepreneur, I realized the real power behind the throne. For those of you that want to be rich, write this down. The real power behind the throne is scale, period. And the person that understands how to scale 
scale, they, they rule the world. They rule the world. And when you understand what I mean about scale, when you understand partnerships, when you understand leverage, acceleration, like how you pull that off in a business context, the way that you have to be willing to give up things. Other people are like, why are you giving that up? Like you have to, to get the other person excited about what you're doing. And here's the thing, this is so deeply ingrained in me. I would much rather have 10% of a billion dollar idea than I would 100% of a million dollar idea. It just, it doesn't make sense. So, but people cannot, from an ego standpoint, they can't do it. They can't do it. And because of that, they're always going to be held back. I am very comfortable with partnerships. I'm very comfortable with other people being equally important or more important than me in like the hierarchy and the grand. If I'm getting what I need to move towards my goals, nothing else matters. Scale. Scale. All right. So you're not going to answer my question about two hours a week. Okay. So what would I actually do if I could only spend two hours a week? So here's the, if I only had two hours, I would spend one hour thinking and one hour mobilizing you guys around that vision because you guys can do a lot. And when I see how much enthusiasm and clarity I can give in an hour, um, it's unbelievable. And every time we do it, I think earlier and often, one of the reasons that I don't actually do early, meaning involve you guys earlier and often in the shifting of the vision is I don't want you to feel like we're, is, we're all over the map, right? Right. Like there is so much power to clarity of focus. This is what we're doing. Go and execute. So, uh, but if I only had two hours, that's what I would have to do. And then it would, honestly, it would vary because a Many times I would have to allocate one of those hours to going out and meeting somebody, getting them excited. I have an absolute fetish with getting in the room with high level people because I'm so, I have the arrogance of belief in myself that I have, I have spent so many years. I need to memorize that fucking scene from Taken because every time I go to articulate this, this is what I want to do. That moment where he's like, I have spent the last however long building a set of skills. That's a nightmare for people like you, right? Like, I've spent the last 20 years building a particular set of skills that allows me to do things at scale. And when I look at huge problems, like I could actually say, if my dream were to terraform Mars, that doesn't scare me. So it'd be a lot of work and all that, but I would just chunk it up and I'd, there's the goal, the vision, work backwards. What are the skills that I have to acquire in order to get there, right? And just start breaking it into pieces. And so that doesn't scare me. That's a superpower. So if you can get me in a room with people, I will make them believe in the vision. I will collect the people that are, um, excuse me, that are going to be necessary for us to get where we're going. And because I've been accumulating all this knowledge, 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 I've yet to get in a room with somebody who I thought was looking at me like, no, nah, this guy's an idiot. It's just not happen. Because one, I stay in my lane. I don't talk about things that I don't know. I'm always willing to um, admit when I don't know something. I'm not afraid to look stupid. And people that have achieved a certain level of success, they get that. They know that it's a strategy to learn, to be open. Uh, I love helping other people shine. Facilitating other people looking good and shining is what I do. It is the, like, if anybody wants to know why we're growing so fast at Impact Theory socially, it's because of that. The guest comes on and all I'm thinking about is how do I put them in a pos position to shine and bring value to the audience? That's it. And because of that, like, the word of mouth is just crazy behind the scenes with the guests. So, right. yeah. Awesome. All right, here's a question from our audience, from Corinne Davis. What are the tips and tricks you use or have used to have such a bright line about only doing that which moves you toward your goals despite how you may feel? I want. I want. I want things in my life so badly it's all consuming and I fan those flames because just like I tell people about a passion, I did not turn inward and find that hunger. I turned inward and saw a spark of interest. That seems kind of neat. And then I fanned those flames and then it was, wow, I really want to get good at this. And then I rewarded myself emotionally for being willing to push myself and try to get good. And then as I got better, I 
rewarded myself for being humble enough to know that now I just know how little I actually know. And so to feed that desire. And then I reward myself for the realization that, hey, like skills shouldn't be acquired in a vacuum. Like they should have a purpose. And But if they're going to have a purpose, like you should actually put them to the test and you should really see if they work. And I reward myself for acknowledging when they didn't work and I needed to go back to the drawing board and build something on that and learn more and get actually better and retest myself and be humble and all of that. And so in that process, you're just fanning those flames, fanning those flames, and it's it's becoming a bigger thing. And then saying, what do I want to achieve with all of this? And then it starts small, and it's not a mission. And then you decide this is gonna be a mission. And once you've decided that it's gonna be a mission, you start getting yourself more excited about it. And so when somebody writes in and says, Tom, this content has really changed my life, and here's what I did because of you, and my life would be fundamentally different because of you, like, I really stop. And I think about that and I think about, wow, like putting in the work, wanting good things for other people, willing to, being willing to be of service of people, making that your mission, like, and tapping into just, I think humans like to be, we're a a social animal, we're a tribe animal, we want to be of use to the tribe. And so like really building that up in me and priding myself on that, my willingness to serve, my desire to serve. It just like, it all starts magnifying over time, over time, over time till you get to the point now where it's like, I have reinforced in myself so many times and said out loud so many times and gotten other people to come on board so many times with the knowledge of we're really going to do something with this company. We're going to build a studio. It's going to be bigger than Disney. We're going to pull people out of the matrix, all of that. And by the way, one of the really cool things about um, recording all of this stuff, go back and watch how I was talking Back in in October, November, even January, when we really started pumping out content, you won't hear the confidence in where we're going because then have it, right? So it's yet another great example of as I focus on this, focus on this, focus on this, think about it. What are the steps? What do we really have to do? Like it starts to get more clear. You'll start to feel that engine of confidence building, the clarity building and all that. But it was a process yeah. It wasn't like at 12, I had this vision and now my life has been all about executing against it. So I really hope people see that. So you build that need, that want. In fact, I'm going to leverage um, Tony Robbins language here. You don't get what you want, you get what you need. So I have taken these flickers of want and I've turned them into a desperate need. I need, I make the demand that this company be what it's going to be. And because of that, like, because of that, I know the things that are coming that are going to knock us off, that are going to be hard. We've got hard times coming for us. Dark days. I used to give that fucking speech all the time. Dark days are coming for you. It's just true. But because I need this to work, I need this to become great. I need to be that person that can pull that off. I know that I'll recenter myself. I will get going again. I will be humble. I will learn and just figure that out and not let it knock me off course. Nice. Um, Wrapping up here, what are some of your other favorite hacks from this episode? You mentioned Naveen. Are there any others that stand out to you that you've started applying since the episodes? Jay Samet's idea, I think, is brilliant uh, of look at the pain points in your own life. Mm -hmm. I'm really trying to apply that within the context of what we're building. Where are those pain points? What are the traps that people are falling into? How can we avoid those? Uh, Nobody wants a quarter inch drill bit. They want a quarter inch hole. So like, how do we leverage that to give the audience what they really want? Um, that, that's another huge one. Um, Amelia Boone's advice, uh, everybody should take like how you build yourself back from defeat. That's just, Yeah, I want to talk about that. I had a note here. So I really liked how she said, um, well, there's two things. So one is about um, giving yourself time to kind of overcome the defeat you've had, Mm -hmm. um, mourn. You've talked about that too. Is that something you kind of picked up from the episode or something you've always done? No, and it was so interesting to hear her say that. And when I was re-watching it, I don't remember if I actually had this impulse on set, but I almost certainly did to like say, oh my God, like I do that that same thing, right? Like, so, but no, I've thought about for more than 20 years, what would I do if I became a quadriplegic? And 
I've always said I'd give myself 30 days to mourn. So she's got me beat two weeks. Um, but I loved what she said. You have two weeks to be a horrible person about this. And I, I guess it's just because it's so fundamental to the human condition that I would be a horrible person, right? And I would feel really bad for my wife during that 30-day period because I'm going to feel sorry for myself. I'm going to whine and cry about it and just why this happened to me and, um, and all of that. But then at day 31, you would never know. You would never know that I just went through those brutal 30 days. And part of why I allow myself those 30 days is I just, I'm not arrogant enough to think that I can escape the process of grief. So I think it's probably good to give yourself that time to really cathartically let it Release, out and all that yeah. stuff. So it just, it, something about that rings so true to me that I don't want to try to sidestep that. Um, but then at the end of that, all the mechanisms that I have would kick in. And the funny, the irony is those mechanisms will actually kick in right away. And I, I would have to like, for certain things, I think something like being a quadriplegic where it is so transformative right there in the moment, it would be easy just to, I'm going to do my 30 days right now. Um, <laughs> but there are other things where I found myself, I so quickly go into all the recuperative mechanisms and I'm so like momentum forward um, that I need release valves later where I'm just like, okay, you need to like, if it does sting, if you're mourning the loss of a friendship or something like that, it's, it's let that out. Like, yeah. don't, don't just try to muscle through. Like don't when it repress. pops up, like, shh, let that be a thing, feel it. Um, and then I get going again. So it'd have to be something really, really extreme. I can only think of one time in my life where I thought I actually need to take time to mourn this. I didn't take 30 days, but I needed to take time to mourn it. Yeah. Um, before I started just then. Nice. Back at it. And the other thing she said is when you're, you know, she's talking about when she came back from her injury and, uh, the first thing she did was just run one mile. Um, and she said, the way you do it is you don't give yourself another option. Mm. And I thought that was really interesting. And it made me think of um, Mel Robbins, which is you kind of start before you have time to think about it, the, the five second rule, which is another hack from this episode. And then the notion of burning the ships mm. to take the shore. So how do, you, how do you get yourself into the mindset of just not giving yourself another option? This is this is advanced class stuff because you've got to be really careful. There are times where people burn the boats unnecessarily, and now um, it, it's just foolish. So, for instance, when we started Quest, we still had the tech company, and we made sure that it had legs. That we figured out some of the like you know rudimentary stuff before we like quit our jobs sure. and had no money and all of that. So that's really really crucial to understand but at the same time defeat was not an option so like we were committed to making it happen and there was a time certainly for me i left a year earlier than everybody else and then i was broke and like you know, it's a whole another story but um you've got to know when is the right moment to to burn the ships but i don't think people will ever fight through the really hard stuff if they give themselves an out right so yeah. when i think about what we're going to do with the studio it's that it's it's all in it's a huge financial commitment b it's just like the time every ounce of my existence is put into this you know when like when people came here last night and they're like you have a studio in your house like and we're about to build another set downstairs which i'm fucking excited about the show that we've got in development right now um so it's really, really important to commit and to go all in. Yeah. I think she's right at the money, but you, you need to be smart about when and how one burns the ships. Yeah, fair enough. Um, one last question from our Facebook Live audience, Marcus Aurelius Owens, which... Is that for real? It's a great I'm name. guessing screen name? I'm guessing screen name. Um, he just has a question, where can I find good content on scaling? I've never read any. So scaling has been my life. So that was just learn by doing. Um, so I'm going to fail you here. I don't know. Okay. Well, if you come across I guess any impact theory. Yeah. Self-serving. <laughs> and if there's anything else uh, you or the team comes across, we'll be sure to share it at some point. Cool. All right. I think that's, that's it. it. Yep. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode. If you haven't already seen the hack episode, be sure to check it out. And I'm going to have to give mad love to Courtney for this one. 
Courtney crushed it, led the team. She'll be the first to tell you this was a team effort for Swayze, for Swayze. Um, but just, yeah, she led this one. It was amazing. Great I'm gonna work. I also have to give a shout out to LC, LC our the marketing house. intern, for doing a lot of the clip pulling and nice. reviewing the episodes. So they both tag teamed it and did an amazing job. Word. Yeah. Well done, LC. Big it up, big it up, big it up. She's right there. She has headphones on. Yep. Uh, so thanks to the team for crushing this one. That was amazing. And very grateful to everyone who came on the show that supplied us with these very amazing clips, uh, hacks, suggestions, tips, tricks, all that stuff. All right, guys, if this brought value, please do share it. That's how we're going to build this community even bigger, which at the end of the day is all we care about. And then if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. <laughs>